pleasure is an act of resistance. We are so conditioned around having to be useful and productive that we often neglect our need for pleasure. Hello and welcome to the Dynamic Creative Podcast. I'm your host, Dylan DeMarcus, and this is your source of tools and inspiration for today's independent artists to activate, align, and empower the creative path to thrive with fulfilling and meaningful work that effectively pierces through the noise. In this week's rich conversation, we tap into the often misunderstood, magnificent multiverse of BDSM with a much needed astute perspective on it and everything it has to offer, along with the important rituals of self-care, understanding boundaries, consent, and kink. Join us. Today I feel super privileged to have on an incredibly dynamic individual whose passions and creative work are seemingly limitless. A multidisciplinary artist who has created work as a performer, fashion stylist, jewelry designer, and art model while simultaneously traveling a nearly two-decade-long healing path that has led to BDSM, dance, yoga, meditation, ritual practices, psychedelic medicine, pleasure-centered healing, fitness training, and somatic therapy. Currently weaving together her passions for healing and self-expression as a professional dominatrix, a sex and sensuality educator and coach, her work supports and guides others towards greater pleasure, integration, and personal empowerment. A self-proclaimed libertine, hedonist, self-care junkie, and the proud parent of a giant boa constrictor, my guest and friend Morgan King. What's up? How are you? I am pretty well. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Yeah. Did I cover everything? Yeah. Okay. Go. Um, <laughs> There's well, probably more. But. Yeah, I would be surprised. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for coming on, and I just want to start by really acknowledging you for the impact you have in the community, with all the lives you touch, the work you do, the stand you are for it, and the soldier you are for breaking the stigma around what you do, mm-hmm. and. As you know, in today's landscape, we all seem to end up super busy, relentless grinding, juggling tasks, work, goals, dreams, family, social lives. We basically have way more roles than ever these days as you know, leaders, business owners, creatives, healers, teachers, artists, advocates, and partners. You know, it's yeah. super easy to get lost in this perpetual unconscious hustling cycle it's exhausting and it gets old and when i glanced at your website sensateindulgence.com which is beautiful i might add thank you one of the things you wrote in there that i feel really speaks to that goes as follows with the pace and stresses of modern life it's all too common that the worlds of sensuality magic and play with us become neglected and dormant I believe this is one of the greatest illnesses we face as a society. I believe that the rekindling and connection with these wild parts of ourselves is vital to our overall health and well-being, end quote. So, Morgan, I totally resonate with with that, and I'd love to hear why you think that the rekindling of that connection to those wild aspects of us are super crucial for the well-being of like high-performance creatives and how they show up in the world. Totally. Yeah. So I used to be a person who suffered from something I like to call DTMS. Uh Uh-huh. Doing too much syndrome. (laughs) I feel it. (laughs) I feel it. Um, And I I think that that's something that's a plague upon our society. There's so much positive reinforcement in our culture, in Western culture, for being a person who hustles being a person who's constantly on their grind and what i know from having taken that path myself Mm -hmm. is that there's actually a limit to how much you can output if you are not balancing out everything that you're outputting with your input and how much you're investing into your own Uh self-care to maintain your mental emotional physical and spiritual well-being sure and I had to learn the hard way by experiencing energetic burnout. Right. I ran Same. a fashion company for like 10 years. I was performing. I was I was doing the absolute most. And and I thought that was, you know, the way it was supposed to be done. I thought that that level of mm, quote-unquote productivity mm-hmm. was what it would take to make it 
as an artist. Mm -hmm. But what it actually got me was a pit of depression. Uh huh. It got me complete burnout. Mentally and, and physically. On every level. Yeah. And it landed me at a place where I realized my life had to completely change in mm -hmm. order for me to be well. Mm -hmm. And when I started to unpack that and kind of tease it out, what I started to understand is that living inside of the system of economy and government that we're inside of, mm -hmm. that isn't going anywhere anytime soon, unfortunately, we are conditioned to overperform. Mm -hmm. Um, to the extent that it's actually not healthy for us. I only understood my worth as a reflection of my productivity. Yeah. You know, if I was yeah, doing more, same. if I was doing the absolute most, that's what would make me worthy in the eyes of, I, I don't know who, <laughs> you know, I don't know who's, whose story that actually <laughs> was. It yeah. came from, you know, watching my mom, who was a single mom, work herself into the ground trying to make ends meet and uh -huh. provide for me. It came from looking at society and seeing how hard it seemed other people had to work in order to just get ahead. Mm -hmm through my own healing process and letting go of a lot of those stories, unpacking my own internalized narratives about productivity, I started to see how societally there was a bigger picture and how much people are suffering as mm -hmm. a result and choosing instead of addressing those things to numb out on some level. And you see this affecting like entrepreneurs and artists and people in general as, as a whole? I mean, see it affecting our entire society, <laughs> yeah, right? Sure. But with artists, it's like a very, it's a very specific thing with artists uh -huh. because there's so little real tangible appreciation mm -hmm. for the arts in this country. Mm -hmm. It's not taken seriously as like a real career path. Totally. And it's like you, you almost have to hustle extra hard to prove yourself as worthy as an artist yeah. in the eyes of capitalism. Yeah, and the impacts of that on your health and physiology is huge. Yeah. <laughs> and then we're also taught this whole like trope about the starving artist and that like if you choose to be an artist yeah. that you are setting yourself up for a life of poverty and suffering and and this is just how it's going to be and you have to work and work and work and work mm -hmm. until maybe you get a break. Uh-huh. And like that shit is toxic. Yeah. I'm only recently beginning to reverse engineer the impact of the starving artist poverty mindset mentality. Oh, yeah. It's it's real. Yeah. <laughs> it's super real. Uh -huh. I mean, the, the first thing that I learned about art, I can remember I can look back at like, you know, art classes in elementary school. And the first thing that I can recall learning about was that Vincent Van Gogh was a deeply troubled, <laughs> mentally ill person his whole life who expressed himself through painting, uh -huh. never earned any money, was super fucking depressed, uh -huh. and then eventually he cut off his ear and killed himself. Oh my God. <laughs> that's the first thing I learned about being an artist. You know, uh -huh. like that's... <laughs> and that story in some form keeps playing itself out over and over and over and over again in the way that we think about art and artists and, yeah. and what your life is going to look like and be. And there are certain ways that artists also get a lot of positive reinforcement for our suffering. Uh huh. You know. Yeah, and it's it's a justification of why we make art and whatnot. Right? And yeah. Yeah. There's some toxicity in there that could be examined. Yeah. You know, there came a moment for me where I had to put that under a microscope in my own life uh -huh. and be like, okay, right, you love art, you're an artist, but what does it mean to be well? Yeah. So with that, I mean, I'm passionate about ways that creatives can help perform more effectively in the world and how do you think your work helps as a clearing for those creatives and folks that find themselves in that position find the freedom to show up and generate that like creative flow state to make impactful work and see through like those struggles of you know that starving artist archetype and the fact that we're not looked at as like total equals in our society mm -hmm. yeah i mean my work is kind of multifaceted, so oh. it depends which aspect of my work you're speaking to, but there are a couple of ways that I can answer that question. Okay, so shoot. One of the things that I arrived at in my own healing, which informs my work, is that pleasure is an act of resistance. Uh-huh. We are so conditioned around having to be useful and productive 
-hmm. that we often neglect our need for pleasure. Yeah. And our society tends to have a pretty toxic relationship to what we call pleasure. The way that we often see pleasure portrayed is over drinking. (laughs) (laughs) Over drinking, over drugging, Uh numbing out on Uh some level that, right? This is how we have fun. Complete excess. Uh Um, Intimacy too, even. Yeah. 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 This is how fun and pleasure were modeled for me as a child. It's like you live this life that's really stressful and hard and so much work and a lot of pain and suffering. And then you use pleasure as an escape. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm really interested in is how to create in your own life an experience of integrating pleasure Uh and sensuality as a practice that you get to have with you throughout every day of your life so that you are developing a robust and healing relationship with pleasure. I guess the idea is working to create a life that has a certain amount of balance between the output and the input, Mm -hmm. between the work and the pleasure, and being able to, through that, create a life that you don't have to numb out from, sure, that you don't have to escape from. Uh-huh, right? the balance, yeah. Yeah. So for people who are high-performance creatives, entrepreneurs, like especially if you're an entrepreneur, you are at very, very high risk for overworking yourself. <laughs> totally. Very fucking high risk. Uh-huh. <laughs> like nonstop work, uh-huh. just putting everything that you have into this baby that is your business. Yeah. And that is not a sustainable way to be and live. Uh-huh. Right? So depending on which aspect of my work you're speaking to, it's like in my coaching work, I work with people to help them create discipline in their lives that allows them to experience a balance of work and pleasure. Right. In some of my other offerings, the experience itself is an experience of pleasure. Uh Uh-huh. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. (laughs) (laughs) And for you to come to these the conclusions of the clarity with your viewpoints on pleasure and whatnot, you must have a, a fairly colorful past and, <laughs> and really to be a, a clearing for others for their healing. Mm-hmm. They need to show up for themselves and heal themselves first and foremost. Uh, I'm curious if there were any pivotal moments, any low points or experiences in your own personal journey <laughs> that really created a shift for you to embark on your own healing journey, which eventually led you to, you know, boycotting the vanilla and mainstream towards the integral intersection of BDSM self-care mm-hmm. practices and healing arts that you find yourself in today. Mm. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So we're, um, we're going to go deep here. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> All right, cool. So about three years ago, that was when I, I had reached that kind of bottom low of my burnout uh-huh. from working myself into the ground uh-huh. as an artist. And I knew that my life had to change, and I was suffering a lot. And I was really struggling with my mental and emotional health. And nobody in my life really knew because... Often I'm perceived from the outside as like strong, mm-hmm. like super badass. I could see that. Th- these aren't things that I have decided about myself. These are things <laughs> other people have literally <laughs> said to me. Oh, Fair you're enough. so strong. <laughs> and most of the people, even people that were close to me didn't really know. It's just my mental health was being overlooked in a really big way, even when I was trying to let people know that I was suffering. Uh-huh. And I experienced a pretty traumatic event right around this same time that I was like really struggling with my depression and that was kind of enough to push me over the edge Uh and never in my life even with all of the pain and suffering that I've experienced had I ever felt completely hopeless Uh I'd never actually felt like giving up on life was the answer and I arrived at that point Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I actually don't really want to keep saying yes to uh-huh. being alive. Uh-huh. And I was like, okay, I don't want to feel like this anymore. 
So what do I need to do? Like, what do I need to do in order to not be in this state of suffering that I am in constantly at all times? Like, what has to change? Because at the end of the day, what it boils down to is it's not so much that I didn't want to be alive. I just didn't want to be alive if life was going to keep feeling this way. I feel you. Right. Yeah. And I knew that in order for me to say yes to life, some shit was going to have to completely transform, like hard left turn. (laughs) Uh And I, for probably about two years, I uh, leading up to this, this point, I struggled and struggled and struggled trying to earn a living off of this business that was up and down, feast and famine. Sometimes it was providing. Sometimes I was literally eating out of a food pantry. Mm-hmm. People in my life did not know this. Uh-huh. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. I just can't. I have to let go of this particular piece of my creative puzzle. Mm-hmm. My identity was so wrapped up in my art But I was like, if I stop doing this, what does this mean about me (laughs) as a creative? Like what if I just stop doing fashion, who the fuck am I? It's confronting. It's super confronting. It was like heartbreak, 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 heartbreak. I was like suffering so much. And then finally I was like, (laughs) no, I'm just not going to do this anymore. You know, it's like I got to that moment where I was like, I don't want to be alive anymore. And that was the turning point. Uh Uh-huh. And I was like, cool, I'm going to stop doing this particular business. Maybe not forever, but for right now. Mm -hmm. For right now, it has to stop. And the moment I let it go, I was like, oh, fuck. How did I, like, how on earth did I hang on to it for that long? Uh But we do that sometimes as artists, you Uh know, and these ideas of like what it would mean to make it with a certain aspect of our art that we will hurt ourselves over it. Sure. Right? And ultimately, it's it's within my control to change that. Uh-huh. And once you stepped into it, there, it the liberation kind of started to pour in. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> like, I had my grief, right? I was like, oh, <laughs> Yeah. And people were like, why aren't you designing stuff anymore? I love your work. And I'm like, it's not feeding me. Yeah. All the joy is gone. Yeah. I want to live a life that includes joy. So what does that need to look like? How Mm -hmm. does my life need to be in order for that to be my experience? Yeah, there's a courage in in career pivots. And most people that I look up to, their careers, like do lots of significant zigs and zags Uh to get to the dynamic place that they're at. You know, Uh it's not this like static linear path. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's dope. Yeah. I'd love to dive into the loaded topic in regards of the conversation of consent and boundaries and our day-to-day relatedness with other human beings that I know is something you're interested in and you've mentioned to me and it's just recently beginning to be unpacked and fully understood in how it's unfortunately only typically talked about in regards of sex and not in the many other areas of life. I'm wondering why is the topic of consent so misunderstood with that tunnel vision and how do you think we can broaden what defines it? Mm -hmm. So I first want to say I'm like super glad that consent is even a conversation that's being had right Mm -hmm. now. And so much of it is about what's happening in the bedroom Mm -hmm. and what's happening with regard to sex. And that's all super important stuff. Sure. But what I'm especially interested in, in examining inside of my own life and also practicing in my work and in relationships that I have with people on every level, you know, friendships, my family, etc., is how consent is practiced in general inside of those relationships. A lot of the suffering in my own life is something that came as a result of struggling with personal boundaries Mm. and not having had any teaching or tools to navigate boundary setting and maintaining from the time I was a young child. Mm -hmm. And and this touches so many different aspects of my life. It touches my, my own relationship with art. It touches my relationship with sexual partners and it touches my relationships with my family, relationships I've had with people I've worked for. So I've started to examine the ways that even as young children, we are taught that we don't actually get to have bodily autonomy and personal agency. Uh-huh. 
for example, when you're at some family dinner and one of your parents is like, okay, you have to go hug Uncle Harold. <laughs> well, no, you actually don't uh-huh. have to hug Uncle Harold. But uh-huh. how many of us were taught that from the time that we were a little kid? Or you have to eat all of the food on your plate that your grandmother cooked because if you don't, she's going to be very upset. Wow. Yeah. Right. And these yep. seem like totally like insignificant things uh-huh. on the surface. Uh-huh. But when you actually dig into the messaging and inside of that them stuff, all up. Yeah. yeah, what that teaches children is that one, anybody can touch them for any reason. <laughs> mm-hmm. And two, they are responsible for uh-huh. somebody else's unfortunate feelings. So you better not do something that gives somebody unfortunate feelings. Uh huh. Kids are like sponges. Sure. Right. And like as an adult, I can look at this and be like, that's absolutely preposterous and fucking absurd. (laughs) Right. But Uh like children absorb this messaging Mm -hmm. and all of that messaging that we get adds up once we become of age to be sexually active to a lot of fucking confusion about consent. Mm -hmm. The conversation about consent, I think, actually needs to go way, way, way back into familial dynamics totally you know i i i still struggle sometimes with my family around consent Uh because they don't have a concept of ideas that are very very important to me now this doesn't mean that they're bad people right it's just there are certain things that often get projected onto us that are expectations and obligations that we did not actually consent to Uh uh-huh Right. Like, oh, well, you have to come and do this thing. It's your family. Mm -hmm. Didn't sign up for that. No, (laughs) I I actually don't. Like I I can say no to that. Uh But there's so much emotional weight that's placed upon these things that we feel like we have to say yes when we actually are a no. Uh And that way of being so easily carries into other aspects of our lives Uh we are not encouraged to actually have a very clear definitive relationship to our no right and our no makes way for our yes yeah right like 100 the no is fucking sacred Mm -hmm. (laughs) the yes is sacred also Mm -hmm. but like no is just saying yes to what your heart is saying yes like that book you mentioned with me in the past, Greg McGowan's the Essentialism. Oh, I love that. The power that of no is, is huge. It's huge. And the way you put that makes that power of consent seem so empowering that you're just boycotting, carrying around this ball and chain of like guilt and shame to like succumb yes. to other people's like twisted expectations of you. The power of no. The power of no. Preach. Yeah, dude. <laughs> uh, I'd love to shift a little bit into the fascinating realm of BDSM and I've only began to scratch the surface personally with experiencing that realm of BDSM culture Mm -hmm. although I had a previous partner where we explored some role reversal and bondage and it was a level of trust and surrender and novelty that I had never explored too much into too much depth but the surrender especially for me had a huge impact I noticed the whole rest of the week after the experience, I was much more relaxed, gentle, patient, receptive in my masculine energy and in all my interactions for that matter. And my ability to focus as a creative also sharpened in ways that I never would have expected. Mm. And from that experience, I can confidently attest being a sub can be fun and playful and extremely beneficial to people's wellness and performance if they're willing. And um, I'm wondering what you think like energetically and like psychologically about the sub dom power exchange dynamic with your clients that makes your work so compelling and important for mental health and performance and sexuality as a whole. Mm. Yeah. So there's so much. (laughs) So, um, So In BDSM, the power dynamics, the power exchange is just intentional. And if you look around at living life, there are power dynamics everywhere. They're everywhere. And it can be so relieving 
if you are a person who is in a leadership role or a managerial position, if you're a boss, if you're a high achiever, if you are responsible for a lot of things in life, to be able to step into a container where you can turn all of that off. You have given up the burden of control to someone else. And that's got to be somebody else that you're willing to put your trust in. I don't recommend doing that with just anybody. But inside of that BDSM container, each person is showing up with an understanding of which role they're playing. And that can be so deeply relieving. Throughout our lives, so many of us have been in situations where we've had our power taken away from us or where we have given away that power without even realizing it. When we step into a container where we are able to play with power in a very conscious, intentional, and consensual way, it can actually be medicine for what it's like to live in a world that continuously tries to strip our power from us in certain ways. And one of the other things that I I love so much about BDSM is that all of those things that we talked about before regarding consent, inside of BDSM containers, the play is built on a foundation of consent. So when we sit down to have a negotiation before a scene, we have the chance to get really clear on what everybody is going to be saying yes to, what everybody's no's are, what everyone's hard limits are. And for a sub, if there are any ways that they're comfortable being pushed or having their boundaries stretched, that's mapped out before you engage in play. So it reduces the possibility that there's going to be some kind of consent violation or accidental overstepping of a boundary. And this can be deeply relieving for the nervous system. When we have a lifetime of experiences sexually that often have come from just confusion around consent, to have all of that stuff completely mapped out before engaging with somebody else's body and somebody else's sensual and or sexual energy, we're doing the work of counterbalancing all of the ways that society has conditioned us around consent. So it's, it's actually like this really rich medicine Mm -hmm. for everything that we just talked about the Uh, last question you asked me Uh all this bullshit and confusion about yes and no and and why and this emotional attachment around people's yeses and nos and all of that conditioning what i have found is that bdsm contains a very particular type of antidote for Uh that Uh because you get to come to it with really a lot of clarity around what it is that everybody's here for. Like if I sit down to negotiate a BDSM scene, if somebody's asking me for something that is outside the scope of what I offer, I don't have to do that. Right. Right? Like Uh there are tons of BDSM practitioners out there and there is somebody that can meet whatever need it is that you have, right? <laughs> uh-huh. So if someone's like, oh, can you do this thing? And I'm like, actually, no. Like, that's that's not what I do. But there's actually a lot of people out there that do offer this. Yeah, I'm sure you've got pr- plenty of requests too. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, totally. And, you know, I, I have a very specific approach inside of this work for how I hold that container. Can you unpack that? Sure. So... When you hear like mainstream media ideas about what a dominatrix is, uh-huh. it's like a very specific stereotype, sure. right? Like, yep. I'm sure you can see her in your mind. You're like, oh uh-huh. yeah, you know, she's like this ice queen, mega bitch, <laughs> brutal <laughs> fucking, <see> right? <laughs> like you see the outfit, you know what outfit she's wearing. Um, mm-hmm. She loves to humiliate men, right? This, this idea of what a dominatrix is, that's just one archetype. Right. And there are folks who that is how they hold that space. Mm -hmm. And if that's what you want, you can go to a practitioner that offers those things. Uh For me, 
I am more naturally suited for the sensual and psychological aspects of domination. Okay. I really relish the opportunity to train people how to serve me. Uh huh. <laughs> that is what I love the most. Okay. That is what I love the most. And there's like, I, I mean, I have lots of other interests. I love impact play, right? I, I do um, I do impact play sessions. Can you, def- can you define impact play? Sure thing. Impact play is also sometimes called corporal punishment. Uh-huh. Um, it's basically the infliction of some kind of impact on the body. Like flogging, with, for example. Yeah, with an implement oh. or a hand. Uh-huh. What's the craziest shit you've used? What is crazy? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, and uh, crazy is so subjective. True. People are like, what's the weirdest thing you've <laughs> ever done? I'm like, I mean, like, what's weird to me is not necessarily weird to the next sure. person. My, uh, you know, average noon on a Tuesday might be somebody else's. Wow, that's fucking weird. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's impact. Okay. Um, and I do enjoy sessions that involve, you know, the giving mm-hmm. of pain, mm-hmm. but I don't, I have a limit in that as a provider that I don't do like really heavy torture stuff. Uh huh. That's just not what I'm into. Right. Fair enough. Right. There are people that love to provide that. There are people who love to receive it. That's mm-hmm. just, that's just not me. Mm-hmm. Um, my approach tends to be one that leans more in the direction of sensuality it leans more in the direction of the art of the tease. Uh-huh. And it is very much about what it is that I want. Uh-huh. And you notice that there's no shortage of clients that want to also fulfill that fantasy? I mean, the thing about getting clients in this particular political climate uh-huh. is that... so. Are you privy to the FOSTA SESTA bills that were passed into law not too long ago? No. Okay, that's a maybe a conversation for another day because it's big, but basically in this post FOSTA SESTA world, a lot of our lives as sex workers have become a lot fucking harder. Uh-huh. Advertising is not as easy. We are constantly getting taken down off of social media, being silenced, removed, and so it's it's not as easy to get clients as oh. it once was. Oh. But do I find that the right clients who are the ones who are a good fit for my work and my approach are attracted to me? Yes. Oh. The clients that I do have are the right kind of clients for me. And and they're not just all like rich old bankers that most mainstream people assume <laughs> i'm sure you know like that's a big stigma i feel oh, like yeah. i mean so would you say that there's any patterns in the types of your clients or, or as well as patterns of behavior in the types mm-hmm. of your clients yeah i love that so the, yeah that's a huge stereotype right sure. J- just like the the trope of um you know the the ice queen <laughs> dominatrix uh-huh. the idea that all of our clients are like rich, fat, old white guys. It's like <laughs> not true. Although, hey, I will tell you, I I love the idea of taking a rich, fat, old white guy's money. Sure. However. <laughs> Down with is, the patriarchy. Yeah, like, <laughs> that is not the extent of my clientele. I have clients who are cis men. I have clients who are women. I have clients who are couples. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say that largely my client base are cisgender men. Uh But as far as any of the other demographics go, it's super diverse. Uh Ethnically, it's really diverse. Age-wise, it's so much more diverse than you would imagine. Uh Uh-huh. I've Crazy. seen, yeah, I've seen people who are in their 20s and people who are in their 60s and uh-huh. everything in between. Uh-huh. There are folks that I see specifically for kink education, and there are folks that I have play sessions with. It's pretty diverse. And is there any aspects that you would consider make a good sub? Hmm. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you can ask this this question to a lot of different people and potentially get pretty different I'm answers. Sure. But I'm sure. For me, follows my protocol uh-huh. to a T. Uh-huh. <laughs> to a T. Uh-huh. Like, 
there is a very specific protocol that I use for booking, oh. screening, inside of my sessions. I have a kink for like personal discipline uh -huh. in my own life. Like, it, like I would actually classify it as a kink. Like I totally get off on it. Uh -huh. Like I'm the kind of person that like, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Like I make my bed every morning oh. and like the pillows are placed just right. And I get off on that too. Oh it's God. Weird. It's, <laughs> it's, it's like, it's amazing. My, you know, when I, when I am curating a home space, it's like, very fucking specific and particular and everything is in accordance with my personal lens on on beauty and mm -hmm. peace in a home space and that piece of myself and my personality it is yes that's like my daily life and that is my bdsm life and sure. so i love a person who is 100 percent open and willing to step into the level of personal discipline that it takes to work with me on that level. Like uh -huh. if someone is coming to me as a sub, uh -huh. if they don't have that level of personal discipline, that they are enthusiastically right. open and ready right. to step into being trained into it uh -huh. and to rise to my standards of excellence and impeccability which right. are fucking high right that seems like that could be highly beneficial and valuable for your clients in the sense of building their own integrity and accountability yes, yes. yeah that's and this this is the piece that like i and so you're touching on something that's like this is like the rich piece of it for me because yes there's like a kink component to this and like yes i i love the power exchange that's happening here. I love being in a space where I get to hold somebody to those standards of excellence mm -hmm. consensually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get off on that. And also, I love to see how I can use that power for good mm -hmm. and to help elicit change in someone's life. Man, those ripple effects are real. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Yeah. So also I want to tap into the that like unfortunately when people think of dom sub relationships their mind often goes to like the cliche 50 shades of gray. You know, I've noticed so many silly cringeworthy stereotypes on the media around BDSM being like reckless or unhealthy and dangerous and I'm sure you've been asked this a great deal, but what are your thoughts on you know, how mainstream media portrays and potentially misrepresents the culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. More stereotypes, <laughs> confusion, misrepresentation. Yeah. Mainly in a negative light, you would think it's fair to say. <laughs> you, well, yeah. And I mean, and it confuses people. Yeah. Right? Like F Fifty Shades of Grey was a fucking travesty. <laughs> um, <laughs> yikes. <laughs> but it, it creates a lot of confusion for people who you know, they have this attraction to kinky stuff, uh -huh. but don't know where to start as far as educating themselves about how to do this stuff uh -huh. in a safe way. Uh -huh. Because what's actually true is that BDSM is fucking risky. Uh -huh. It is. <laughs> like, it can be dangerous. Uh -huh. And in order to step into that space in a risk aware way, and in a way that is completely honoring everybody involved mm -hmm. you need some education like yeah you can you know you can play around with like a little spanking when you're having <laughs> sex and like you know, whatever you know. uh -huh. but like if you really want to go in and like do some serious play with power dynamics and types of play that are potentially physically risky uh -huh. you need to have education totally. around that and it's yeah. not just education of like the technique of flogging <laughs> it's education around how to hold this space in right. a way that is totally safe totally for everybody totally and so the the thing that the media doesn't do is show that specific aspect of it totally there's a show out on netflix that's some dominatrix show uh-huh it's like fictional show oh, about man. a about a dom <laughs> <laughs> apparently it's not good i i, I haven't even looked surprise, at it surprise surprise People are like, yay, there's a dominatrix show. Cool. And 
so the thing about it that is problematic to me, it's like, okay, yeah, it's nice that there's a certain amount of exposure of yeah. a culture that for so many is is important and a lifestyle and a source of income. That's great. But actual real sex workers are being erased from their advertising platforms, erased from social media, erased from the fucking internet. And that's not being covered. And Netflix yeah. has a fucking dominatrix show where people are glorifying the idea of sex work in some way that's probably not true or accurate, yeah. but actual real sex workers are being disappeared from the internet. Mm, the irony, man. That shit's not cool. Nope. Duh. You know? Right. Since we're on that topic, do you see any other blatant stigmas in today's BDSM that you think are worth oh, diffusing? God, so many. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's there's Hit like me with your couple of big ones. There's the stigma around sex work itself, and then there's like stigma around BDSM. Some people think that people who are into BDSM are fucked up. Yeah. And what people don't understand is the thing that I mentioned before. That's about centering trust and uh -huh. consent in how you play with another person totally it doesn't matter what the fuck you're into there is something so beautiful about coming to an experience with another person mm -hmm. where it is centered in open communication transparency trust building safety like we don't even have this in the sex that most people are having with their tinder dates totally having some idea that people who are into BDSM are damaged or fucked up. Totally. When our sexual culture is, is not rooted in all of the things that I just mentioned. Right. Inherently flawed. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so BDSM is actually, in my experience, the absolute safest kind of container uh -huh. that I have ever personally exchanged on some kind of intimate level with another human being. Uh-huh. Man. It's powerful, yeah. you know, like even people who are not kinky could have a really big takeaway from learning about the structure of ethical BDSM and applying it to their sex having in their relationships. Yeah, facts. Right. You know, it, it seems like it can be a really tender space as well. And being a sub seems like it could be an intense emotional experience mm -hmm. and potentially trigger even a lot of things. So when engaging in BDSM, it would seem important to be cognizant of your mental health and also not to look at submission work as a replacement for actual mental health professionals. Yes. And with that, I'm wondering if you have any experiences where a client has ever blurred the lines of the two, and as well if you think there's an importance of not allowing clients to mistake you for their actual therapist. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I, I even like <laughs> I say a thing on my website about like one of my hard limits is like using our sessions for therapy. Totally. I don't like that's yes, there is a therapeutic and healing quality to BDSM for uh -huh. many people. Uh -huh. But I am not a therapist. Uh -huh. Some BDSM practitioners are actual therapists. But uh -huh. not all of us are, and that is not the function of the work that we are doing. Uh -huh. There is no substitute in my eyes for professional therapy. Agreed. Right. So, mm -hmm. like, yes, if you are working through something inside of the work that you're doing in BDSM, mm -hmm. and you are experiencing healing from that, amazing mm -hmm. but if there are other layers that you need to dig into and unpack doing that with your provider is not necessarily ethical yeah right like coming to a session and just unloading about all of your stuff <laughs> or expecting advice or uh -huh. answers no yeah you know, there there are really things that only a a professional therapist can hold for yeah. you. Right. Um, and that doesn't mean that I don't talk with people and have conversations. I love talking with my clients. Yeah. Um, but I feel like BDSM is a practice that really goes beautifully when it walks hand in hand with 
you being in therapy. Mm-hmm. And totally. And I'm not saying that because I think that people who practice BDSM need therapy. I am saying this because I think that therapy is really fucking helpful right. for most people. Right, totally. Kinky or not. And to integrate those two, there's a semblance. Absolutely. It's super powerful. Right. Yeah. There isn't a core relation between mental health and BDSM that I can see other than the fact that when you're working on your mental health, you have to make space for that within your play in the same way that if you had a broken leg, you wouldn't want to be in a bondage that would further injure your leg. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, do you, well, since we're on that topic, do you think though there also is like a workability and a semblance with mental health and BDSM and self care though? Like, like, as you said before, you can kind of massage the two in a mindful space as well. If there's still boundaries around it. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like mental health is, it's a tricky topic because there's still so much stigma around mental health Mm -hmm. in our society at the end of the day most people struggle with their mental health totally some people are addressing it some people are not it's Mm -hmm. not really celebrated in our culture just yet to work on your mental health Uh uh-huh you know there's there's still this idea that people who who like go to therapy or need need therapy are crazy this is only the crazy people it's like (laughs) (laughs) sorry you're just in denial yeah no really like we we at this point in in our development as a society are the sickest that we've ever been on so many levels totally and people are really suffering and so working on your mental health and resourcing yourself in a way Uh that is going to help you do that whether Uh it's through any different type of therapeutic modality like different things work for different people i think that that's really important for everybody to figure out for themselves and what's going to work for them when you are a kinky person and you're also up against all of the other stories and narratives in our society that can make an impact on your mental health there's like this other layer because there's so much stigma around being kinky Uh uh-huh that you have this other layer of shame Uh uh-huh i mean we, we carry so much shame as a society on so many levels and in a lot of ways mental health is very contingent upon how much shame we're carrying around with us at any given point in time for sure and when you get to step into a BDSM practice, when you get to embrace the fact that you're a kinky person and share that in a space that's safe, uh-huh. there is a tremendously healing quality to it because it is counteracting that shame mm-hmm. and giving you permission to be expressed as you actually are. Right? So it's not therapy but it can be therapeutic in that way Uh because you get to be fully expressed. You get to feel safe in who you are. Uh You get to feel held. Mm -hmm. You, you get to be yourself in ways that maybe you never were able to be. Yeah. I mean, I know with my brief experience with it, the surrender that I allowed myself and the person that allowed myself to do it, like I discovered all sorts of things about me that I didn't know I had. And it, it was, really a positive experience for sure yeah and you offer a lot of services and like in addition to like typical services like fetish play and bondage and corporal punishment like you mentioned like some professional dominatrixes offer coaching services that focus on like confidence building improving self-esteem even helping others with like fitness goals and like dating and professional development. I'm assuming that like the brutal honesty involved in the Dom stratosphere could like successfully translate into those realms. And I'm, (laughs) I'm wondering if you see there being a successful carryover with how integrated the work can be. And is that like something you do as well? Like with the coaching and the, just like all the offerings that you have. Yeah. I find Personally, for me, um, that the unique skill set that is required for my dom work is very similar 
to the skill set necessary for the other things that I offer that are not BDSM. Uh -huh. So inside of my coaching, inside of my professional organizing work, my decluttering work, uh -huh. all of this stuff is in alignment with like my own personal discipline practices. Uh -huh. But holding the kind of space for people inside of my coaching work is super similar mm -hmm. to my BDSM session work. The source code just carries over everything. It carries over. <laughs> um, awesome. and, and at the end of the day, it's leadership, mm -hmm. right? Sure. It's, it's guiding another person who is putting their trust in you. Mm -hmm. That's what it boils down to for me. Yeah. And, you know, there, there are things that I might would say in BDSM sessions that I would never say to a professional organizing client <laughs> <laughs> like, unless they have explicitly consented yeah. to me saying something like that. Right. Uh -huh. But it's like I find that the, it's that leadership aspect that really carries over for me. Totally. Yeah. That's that's rad that, that there's a integration there. The way you articulate your work makes me so confident that every man and woman could be so deeply benefit from this work and what would you say to somebody who like wants to find their dom and or you know somebody who's on the fence <laughs> 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 am i kinky am i not <laughs> i don't know i think so <laughs> um, so i mean there's there's so many different aspects to the work that i do personally but if someone is is like specifically looking for a dom uh -huh. because they want to have that kind of experience. I think it's really important to take some time to see what's out there uh -huh. because there are a lot of providers. There are so many different approaches to this work. In the same way you would want to look for the right therapist. Boom. Yeah. Exactly. Like not everybody is going to be the right fit. Uh -huh. I'm, I am not the person for everyone. Uh -huh. My, style is not for everyone my look is not for everyone mm -hmm. yeah it's just y you need to find the person that you feel you can step into that space of trust with like if, right. if you're a submissive person who's looking for a dom uh -huh. do your research you know uh -huh. um if you're a kinky person who's new uh -huh. and who's just like but i don't know where to start <laughs> <laughs> um, just googling stuff <laughs> <laughs> um education it's yeah. super important you know and that's like it's another component of the work that i do it's like even if you're not a submissive looking for a dom it's worthwhile to get education uh -huh. about kinky shit uh -huh. even if you're vanilla uh -huh. it's worthwhile to get education about sex yeah you know yeah i'm totally amped to discover all the kinks that i probably got under some psychic covers so all about <laughs> it. is there anything else that you want to share with the listeners on like what you're up to in the mm. community or like any new endeavors or personal projects that you're up to as well as like maybe the best ways that we can keep a hold of you totally so the best place for folks to connect with me online is through my website sensateindulgence.com s-e-n-s-a-t-e indulgence also my instagram is a great place to get a feel for what i do and my inner world my thoughts about kink and healing and that is Sensate Indulgence. Also, I have another Instagram that is under construction at Sensate Arts. I will be leaning more heavily into my coaching and education offerings in this next year. And there will soon be a website for that. And Sensate Arts is the Instagram where you can find that aspect of my work. And because we are now in the age of social distancing, I have a lot of other virtual offerings that I am sharing for folks who are interested in my BDSM and erotic work, but are deep in quarantine. And the best way to find out about all of my virtual offerings is just to head over to my Sensei Indulgence Instagram and click the link in my bio and that will give you lots of different options to play and interact and session with me and serve okay yeah. i love it thank you so much for your time the work you do is incredibly impactful and i hope 
you continue to just keep crushing it with these ripples. Thanks. Yeah. It's really good to do this with you. I know both of our lives have like taken these really interesting transformational shifts and yep. like it's really cool to be sitting across the table with you specifically having this conversation for sure yeah. I'm a, it's a privilege i yeah. appreciate you morgan thanks All you right. too